Welcome to yet another edition of our online entrepreneurship uh, initiative. I'm Leroy Kumalo and I'm the facilitator of the training. Well, let's remind ourselves briefly of the ground rules um, of our session before we get started. Remember, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end of our of our training of the of, of the day. That's when we have a discussion and question and a question and answer session. Before now, perhaps you can uh, note down your questions and post them in the chat poll. Then we're going to discuss them at the end of the session. This is the continuation of um, or the last section of our sales, marketing, and e-commerce module. To recap, we discussed the four pillars of marketing and their importance. I hope the video helped us have a deeper understanding of the four pillars of marketing. We also discussed the video that showed us the importance of agricultural marketing. What is agricultural marketing and its role in our businesses? We discussed the importance of market segmentation. After segmenting, we understand our segmented customers so that we have an idea of how to reach our targeted customers. Now, I want to discuss further the branding aspect distribution, the social media, and the e-commerce. To get started, branding and pricing. In this section, we want to understand the value of a brand and how it communicates the meaning and identity of our business to our consumers and how this can be structured as well. Before we get started, please test your knowledge regarding branding. A level of understanding with regards to brand identity versus brand image, as well as pricing strategies. Your brand and your customers. When you hear the word brand, what comes into your mind? What's a brand? Perhaps we might think of big labels like Adidas, like Nike. All those are sentimental brands that have sentimental value to a customer. When you go out to buy a clothing item, some shoes, something to wear, there's a certain brand that you want to look at. Think of um, our farming um, equipment that you use, or perhaps it can be the equipment, or perhaps the seeds that we use. There's a certain brand that we're looking for. Why? Because we value the quality of that brand and perhaps we've been using it for a long time and it's been working for us. That's a brand. Your business as well, your produce should have such a brand which is sentimental to your customers. Now, to understand more on this um, section, let us watch this video. It discusses more on uh, brand identity. Please let us watch this video. Okay, just a second. The video discusses what your brand say to your customers. I was really excited uh, when Paul said that we were going to be talking about brands today and, and the notion of branding and marketing and why it's so important. Because as soon as you say brand, if you're like me, right, I think of all the cool brands that I see in the consumer marketplace. I think of brands like Nike, Apple, Google, even McDonald's. And often these brands mean a lot to consumers means so much that they actually have value. I know that each summer, Business Week, uh, a magazine in the US, publishes the top 100 brands in the world. And this is done by a company called Interbrand. And what they do is they look at each of the brands that exist, and they try to put a monetary value on how valuable just that brand name is. And so, of course, the usual suspects, right, the Apple, the Google of the world, are the ones that are at the top. What's interesting is they're often valued at billions and billions of dollars, 60, 70 billion in fact. 
Now, obviously, consumer brands are important. Why? Well, they give value to the consumers in so many ways. One of the biggest ways is, is they become a symbol. In other words, if you drive a specific type of car, let's say you're driving a Lexus or a Porsche or a Toyota, what you drive probably says something about you. In a similar way, what you wear, whether you're wearing jeans that are designer, that have a fancy label, or, or something just more casual, maybe a Levi's brand. The brand that you're wearing says something about you. You see, brands for consumers are symbols that give meaning and identity. And that's why people will pay more for these types of branded products. I had thought that consumer brands, you know, real end consumer brands, were really where branding was important. And I used to teach in class, and I remember very vividly teaching in a class a number of years ago, talking to the students about how for some products, maybe branding wasn't so important. And I was specifically thinking about business to business situations. Because in those situations, the business is selling to another business. And the symbolism of brands that I've been talking about probably doesn't really apply. And I was using an example I remember in class of nails. And talking about how when builders would go into hardware stores and they'd buy nails, they'd go back to the big bin and they'd, and they'd, they'd get a bunch of nails, they'd take them to the front and they'd buy them. And I remember saying that, you know, for nails, does it really matter if they're branded? Does it add any value? And I was shocked when one of the students in the back of the class put up their hand and said, you know what, Professor Dell, I disagree. Because I work for a company called Tree Island Industries. And we make nails. And one of the most important things that we do is we brand our nails. And I was like, shut up, really? He's like, yes. Because we can put them in boxes, we can put them in tubs, and we can sell them at a premium. And I was shocked. It wasn't until a few years later that I came upon another example of this. I was doing a consulting job for a shipping company called TK. An interesting brand, TK, but it's a big, big shipper of oil and oil products. Over 10% of the world's oil actually is shipped by this company. They have huge Afromax tankers, liquid natural gas ships, and they move product for customers. Now, who are their customers? Well, Shell, British Petroleum, mobile, big oil companies. And you would think again, why would they need to brand their product? Part of my consulting job, though, was to talk to one of these customers, a company called Stat Oil, which is based in Norway. This company obviously drills oil in the North Sea, and they use TK to ship the oil that they produce. I went to Norway and I asked the company, you know, what do you think of TK? And I was surprised that they told me that the company the logo of the company, when they see it come into port on the, on the smokestacks of the ship, that it actually gives them a feeling of comfort and safety, a feeling of trust. And I was, I was thinking as I was hearing this, that this actually did apply to the company. Because TK has a number of values, integrity, teamwork, responsibility, safety, that clearly are coming through in their brand. So this leaves me with a bit of a puzzle, to be honest, because you've got these business models that I don't think really need brands, especially when I compare them to consumer products, which really need brands to survive in the marketplace. I'm going to pose this one to Paul. Do all companies need branding? And if so, you know, why? Paul, what can you do for me here? Thank you. I hope you really enjoyed that one. Do you need branding? Do you think we need to brand our vegetables? Have a certain brand for our vegetables or whatever we produce of our business? Well, think about the video. Think about the value of branding and what it says to your customers and other stakeholders involved in your line of business. Brand identity versus brand image. There are two ways to understand our brand. There's the intended or internal view of the brand. This is the brand identity as designed by the company. Then there's the external uh, view or the perceived view, how it is viewed by the people of the company. Let us watch the following video that helps us understand 
the difference between the brand identity as well as the brand image. Let us watch. Now that we've established that customers are having conversations about brands, it can be helpful to see how this might break down in two overlapping circles laid out so. There's the intended or internal view of the brand. This is the brand identity as designed by the company. And then there's the external or perceived the perception of the brand on the outside. And this is where we get into the brand image, the reputation, and this fuels the word of mouth that we talked about earlier. Now, when the gap here has a strong overlap, it suggests that the company has a good understanding about how to design a brand in a way which is credible as a whole experience for the customer. And you might actually see something where there is almost a large overlap like that. You can then imagine where there's a disconnect here, where what the customer perceives the external view, the external image is very different from what the company intended. So what we are really doing here is underscoring the fact that perception of brand based on the experience and based on the conversation that's been had about it is key to the management of that brand. One of the interesting pieces of work in this area that really has informed a lot of the discussions around branding uh, is a piece of work by uh, Reese and Trout, and it is called Positioning the Battle for Your Mind. Now, uh, the whole concept of positioning, we covered uh, a couple of sections ago, and I had said as we went through it that actually positioning played through to our product, played through uh, here to the brand and to the marketing communication. And this is just really underscoring it. But this really recognizes the perceptual nature of what we're dealing with with brands and the importance of understanding how the stimulus that we provide in our brand design here is perceived on the outside. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that video that discussed about the branding and the brand identity versus the brand image. Now we see the importance of developing a brand which is credible and which you as yourself as the business owner understand and also that we draw your customers to your brand or your products. But now marketing also we need to think about our, our pricing strategies they have to allow us to penetrate the market. Firstly, price sensitivity. People always get confused on how to discuss the topic of pricing. Now, the first point that we're gonna look at is understanding who our customer is. We need to value the importance of segmenting our customers that will allow us to have an understanding of who our customer is. Let us watch this video that discusses briefly about um, uh, price segmentation, um, price sensitivity, so that we see the importance of price sensitivity in our operations. Um, I'm, I'm quickly setting up the video now so that we can enjoy it quickly.
Okay. Price and sensitivity. There we go. Please enjoy. Today we're going to talk about pricing and pricing is a really good way to start to see how a number of our different topics come together. People often get confused about how to address the topic of pricing. The starting point really is to look at who our customer is and their point of view. Do they consider us to have a differentiated value proposition? Do we have a real point of difference? Or are we quite similar to everybody else? If we've got a real point of difference, it will typically come out in our brand and our extended offering. And if we don't, then they will see us being quite similar to our competitors. If you are entering a crowded marketplace or you are part of a crowded marketplace where there are many competitors who appear to be similar in the mind and judgment of customers, then it can be really useful for you to do some research and look at comparables on pricing. I'm not saying that you should set your pricing just based on what your competitor is doing. I'm just saying that the customer's tolerance for variance from the norms will be lower. We often talk about this as pricing sensitivity. And so pricing sensitivity is really suggesting that if you bring your price up a little bit and there are lots of comparable offerings in the marketplace, then likely what you would see is, is you would see your volume decline quite quickly. Um, and so that's where there is high pricing sensitivity and conversely if there is low pricing sensitivity you could actually put your pricing up but you wouldn't see a decline in volume. So this is one of the things that you can test out uh, and testing pricing sensitivity uh, alongside doing some secondary research can really help you to understand what your degrees of freedom might be. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that video. Most importantly, pricing. Have an understanding of your customers. Know how uh, the income breakout is like, so that you're able to price your, uh, your products in a very good manner that won't drop the volumes of your products or your service. How about certain pricing strategies that we can use? For example, skimming open and penetration pricing. With penetration pricing, we are trying to penetrate the market. We're trying to price our products and services in a way that will be acceptable easily in the market in order for us to quickly gain a market share. Now, the video to follow discusses about skimming and penetration approaches. What sort of approach is this and how can we use it uh, at our business operations, especially with the view of um, increasing our market share in the industry? I'm going to play our video for now that talks to price um, skimming and penetration. Let us watch. So I talked about some of the limitations or restrictions available to you with pricing choices. But if you've done a good job of the earlier stages of your marketing design, if you've got a higher point of difference, if you are either resegmenting a market or creating a new category, then this gives you more choices around a number of things, including pricing. So 
What will happen if you are entering in a new way with something novel? Then consumers have got less basis for comparing you with something else. And so you can set expectations around pricing and you can focus on their willingness to pay. And what we want to do is, is we want to be really clear that this is our focus on pricing and how we set pricing. We don't want to do something known as cost plus. Right? What do we mean by cost plus? Cost plus means let's look at our internal costs, add a desired profit margin, and then set the pricing like that. Why wouldn't we do that? A few reasons. First of all, the price that we then might want to charge might be far more than the willingness to pay. So we won't sell anything. Or secondly, we might price it at less than the customer's willingness to pay and then we might leave some money on the table. We could have charged more if we wanted to. We should at least know that before we make some choices. So as we take this forward then, assuming that we have something that's novel, something that's really differentiated, where there is a higher willingness to pay on behalf of the customer, how should we go about this? We have a number of initial choices that we can make. We can take what is termed a skimming approach, or we can take what is known as a penetration approach. So let's just go into these in a little bit more detail. A skimming approach basically says that if this represents here the potential market that we can target, then initially we will do some micro-segmentation. We will skim at the top those people who are willing to pay more money for our items. So we often see this when there is something new that has come into the market. When Apple first launched the iPhone a number of years ago now, it was $800 without contract to buy. And there were certain people, early adopters, that would go and pay that amount of money. Clearly the price has come down and the pricing is also now bundled into service contracts and so on and so on. However, at the beginning, this is how they sold it. So you might do that if you've got some advantage over time. You see it quite often it happen with uh, uh, prescription drugs where there is a patent in place and it allows there to be uh, um, a skimming of the market and a keeping the price up. If you think that you are going to have competitors that will respond very quickly, you don't have patent protection, you don't have differentiation that you can hold on to uh, really clearly, then you may well go with penetration pricing. What's penetration pricing? It says of all of the people that we think might reasonably buy from us over a period of time, we know that if we price it lower down here, then those customers will all buy from us initially and then it means that our competitors will not get that sale. So if the cycle time on a second purchase in the category is months or years, you may want to do this to preclude your competitors from coming in. And indeed, sometimes you might even signal ahead of a launch that you are going to go at a pricing like this to put competitors off. So you need to know what you would be giving up in terms of higher pricing for a sub-segment, and you also need to know that you can make things at a low enough cost that you would still make an acceptable price. So these are some choices for you about how you might go about pricing. It's not always about taking the maximum available. You may want to be able to take a larger uh, overall market and, and be more successful competitively. And this would be a strategic rather than tactical approach to setting your pricing. Thank you. I hope you understood the importance of present presentation and also the skimming um, present strategy in order to penetrate our market, as well as the importance of pricing with a view of meeting our desired profits as well, not just reducing our prices, but with a view of um, generating profits for our businesses. Then let's now move on to the distribution, marketing, and communication session. Here you want to understand and appreciate the importance of distribution from a marketing perspective. Now, test your knowledge with regard to importance of distribution in the value chain, as well as access to markets. Please, rate us uh, your level of understanding on that, on that aspect. 
distribution. This is how products move from our farms to the wall sellers, to the retailers, then to the end user. This aspect has a huge impact on how brands and products are marketed. So we're going to look at distribution from a marketing perspective. We're going to focus more on how we can use the internet, the social media, or how this has also disrupted traditional uh, ways of distribution that we have always been used to. It is one of the most important aspects of marketing mix. So we need to really have an understanding of it, of how important it is in our business operations as well as in the value chain. We're going to watch a video that discusses about the distribution strategy. So this feature will assist on us understand um, the importance of distribution in the value chain and how we can utilize it in order to make sure that um, it's one of the most important marketing aspects in our service offering. I'm quickly setting up the video and then we should be able to enjoy it shortly. Okay, there we go. Distribution strategy. Okay, please enjoy the video. Today we're going to talk about distribution, arguably one of the most important aspects of the marketing mix. Why? Well, it's, it's because distribution is how the products get from the, the company to the actual consumer. And if that didn't happen, you know, we wouldn't have marketing. When you think about distribution, think about yourself. You know, how do you buy products, right? You may go to the grocery store, maybe you go to a department store, maybe you hit up a specialty retailer that's carrying your favorite line item. Or maybe you go to a garage sale. These are all ways that, you know, products come to us, the way the distribution channel works. But perhaps the most revolutionary form of distribution that we now use almost every day is the internet. And that's where I'd like to base my story, because the internet has been a true disruptor to distribution. And it has changed the way that we think about how products get to consumers. The case study that I want to focus on is Amazon. And this is a brand that most of us know. Why? It's, it's huge. Amazon is in a number of countries around the world. It's truly changed the way that consumers get products. And it's not that old. It started in 1994 with an idea that Jeff Bezos had, the founder. He thought there's something new on the horizon. This internet thing could be really important when it comes to selling products to consumers. And maybe there's something I can do here that would be really cool as a new business model. What he did was he made a list of 20 different types of products that perhaps he could sell on the internet, use the internet as that distribution mechanism. He narrowed that list down to five computers, computer software, videos, compact discs, and books. And it was this last one, books, that he chose. Why? He saw an opportunity here. Because while most grocery stores or small little retailers could only stock 20 or 30 titles on the internet, he could have a warehouse of thousands of titles and then sell to consumers whatever their need. This might remind you of this idea of the long tail, something that we talked about in one of the first lectures. This is what Jeff Bezos saw for Amazon, the ability to warehouse a lot of goods in one location and then distribute it around the world as the orders came in. Now, interestingly, Amazon didn't have a fast business model. In fact, their idea was that they would take almost five years to come to profitability, a very slow approach in an internet era that was all based on hype and excitement. In fact, when the internet bubble crashed in 2000, 
Amazon was one of the only organizations that was ready and survived. Their business model was very well established. At the heart of the model is the way that Amazon gets the products to the consumers. And they use big distribution centers, huge warehouses, thousands and thousands and thousands of square feet. And they locate these distribution centers. There's 145 now around the world in locations that enable them to basically touch anyone. What's interesting to you is that these locations, at least initially, were not based on geography. So while it makes sense to put a, a distribution center in California or one close to New York, they actually chose distribution centers with a different competitive advantage in mind. Because initially, retail sales on the internet were not subject to retail taxation, at least in most states here in the United States. And so what they did was they chose distribution center locations that avoided that extra cost of tax to the consumer. And that became a competitive advantage, one that they actually leveraged for many years because they were able to sell their products at a lower price than some of the retail competitors. This resulted in great profits and a lot of customer loyalty to the Amazon brand. Only recently has Amazon changed this approach because taxation law has started to change and the organization has pivoted to trying to build these distribution centers, centers where orders come in, orders are filled, and then orders are sent out to much closer to these large consumer populations. Because now, instead of the taxation benefit, what we're interested in as an organization is finding benefits to the consumers in terms of the speed with which they receive the product. I'm sure we have an, a perspective of the importance of, um, of distribution, of proper distribution channel in marketing. This will allow us to have a greater, a, well, a, a greater a competitive advantage of our customers. Now, with regards to distribution, there are certain channels in which we can use. Firstly, we have the channel partners and also we have dynamics of intermediation. Now, who are the channel partners? Partners. Let us watch the following video that discusses the channel partners and how we can also think about utilizing such in our in our own businesses. I'll be setting up the video shortly that talks to channel partners and see how this play a vital role in marketing our businesses. Okay, there we go. Channel partners, please enjoy. So now we've established that there are choices about going directly or indirectly to customers, I want to come back to a couple of fundamental questions. Who are the channel partners, the intermediaries? What do they do? And then why might you make a choice to go with one or more channel partners versus going directly yourself? So let's break this down. Who are they? Well, you often know channel partners as retailers, a Safeway, a Walmart. You may know them as an online retailer, like an Amazon. And, or in your own industry, there may be some other sort of middlemen. Uh, so there's lots of different terms for this, and you can have a look at the glossary uh, that's provided uh, online to see what other synonyms might be used. So what roles do they undertake? Well, the fundamental role is this one of access to customers. My customers may be spread out around the town, the country, the world, and a retailer like a Safeway, they have built stores, they've invested in that to distribute products close to where people live and to provide people with lots of choices, not just from one company. So that's the fundamental thing that they do. But in addition to this, what might they also do? They might store products, 
and maybe they need to be stored particularly in warm environments or dry environments or cold environments. Um, they may indeed um, break them down into um, smaller bundles or they may aggregate them up into large bundles that consumers want um, and they may also provide training, installation, uh, support with warranties, returns, etc. So understanding the what uh, is important and then the next aspect I want to deal with before we get to the why on choices is, is what are the financial implications? So we're going to follow the money in the channel. This is often termed channel economics um, and channel economics plays out as follows. We're going to take a really simple example. What we're going to do is, is we're going to look at a customer that pays $10. This is at the customer end and the customer is paying $10 for an item. So in the direct channel, which is represented here above the line, then the customer is buying from the company directly and as a result the company gets all $10. Fantastic. Let's look below the line. In the indirect channel, what we are going to do is, is we're going to assume that there is a retailer that the customer is buying from, like a Safeway. And in this instance, the retailer is going to take 50% of the selling price. The percentage will depend on your industry, it will depend on your geography, it will depend on your negotiating power, but this is not unusual. We're then actually going to have a second intermediary, a wholesaler, and the wholesaler here is going to take 10%. So that leaves us with 40%, or in this simple calculation, it leaves us with $4. If we receive $4, we've got to be really clear when we set our selling price that the $4 is sufficient to cover our cost of goods, our selling and general administrative expenses, and indeed any profit that we might be planning to have. So as you can see, distribution choices, they link very, very closely to what we covered earlier on around pricing. Now, the last question, why? Why would you choose to give up possibly 50, 60 percent or more of what the customer is willing to pay to a partner for distribution? Well, it's because the partner is good at doing that and you're going to focus on what you do well. So a company like Procter & Gamble, Tide Laundry Detergent, they'll tend to sell through retailers and through wholesalers and other intermediaries and they will work their business plan around this uh, sort of amount of money relative to the selling price. Whereas there are some other companies, let's take Zara, the fashion retailer, and they will tend to sell directly through their own stores and they will work on the basis of being able to capture that amount. So these are choices that you have uh, and more often than not we see that use of channel partners partially or completely is part of the marketing mix and decision process. Thank you. I hope we we enjoyed that video that talks to channel partners. Can you think of any of these in our agricultural sector? Any wholesalers that we supply to who eventually um, we offer commission to because they distribute our products? These are the channel partners that we're talking about. Do you think we can make use of these? Are they feasible in your line of work? Think about it and make sound decisions for your business operations. Let's move on to one of the most important aspects, the social media. In this aspect, we want to understand and monitor um, how to monitor and facilitate the online conversations that are happening, especially when we are focused on social media marketing. It's impact on our businesses and any new trends that are available. <laughs> Please test your knowledge. How's your level of understanding with regards to the role of social media marketing, impact of social media, and any new marketing trends? Social media has been, has proved to be one of the leading tools and the source of marketing. 
It can be paid platforms where you pay my um, monthly subscriptions for our marketing. It can be free platforms or just advertise to the general public as well. It continues to gain popularity no matter where it is in the country today or in the world. But we need to understand the effectiveness of social media. Do you think the social media is effective or can be effective in our business operations? Well, the social, um, the next video will discuss about the use of social media. It will give us an overview of um, the social media as well as uh, its effectiveness in our operations. I'm setting up the video now. We should be able to enjoy it shortly. Okay, social media, paid, owned, and earned media. Let us um, let us watch the following video. Hope you enjoy. Social media is one of the most interesting areas of modern day marketing. It's fast changing, it's exciting, but it can be confusing for marketing practitioners. And so it's no wonder that non-marketers in business can have questions about how does it work? Is it effective? Should we be doing more or less of it? What I want to do is to set a context for you for understanding this. Please consider three overlapping circles laid out thus. They represent paid media. This is our traditional advertising. Owned media, which might be a retail storefront or it may be a website that we send people to. And what we are doing here is, is we're setting expectations from paid to owned and there could be good synergy between these. People have had the expectations set appropriately, or there could be a disconnect. So there's clearly an overlap here, and we're trying to make sure it's a synergistic and positive overlap. And then finally, we're dealing here with earned media. And earned media is what people say about us. This is known as word of mouth, sometimes short formed to WOM, and with word of mouth, we could have positive word of mouth or negative word of mouth. And word of mouth has existed long before social media, but social media gives it scale and speed uh, to move along. And so how might we see these three interplaying? Well, if we do a good job of owned media, then we can leverage it so that we get positive word of mouth at scale and in turn, this should mean that we can spend relatively less on paid media. So in this way, we would have more effective marketing communication in terms of its impact on consumer behavior. And equally, we would then have a more cost effective approach to our marketing communications. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that video that discusses about paid media and end media. Well, we see the importance, firstly, the most important aspect, the word of mouth. Most of our advertising is word of mouth. We spread the word about our products through our partners, our friends, our relatives. This is the most important aspect in our marketing. Hence, it is very important. It can impact the amount of money we spend paid media. Okay, going back to my slides. Now, the impact of social media. 
this is one of the platforms you saw um, mm -hmm. where it was just like we have discussed uh, um, the paid marketing. It's also very important as one of the most aspects used in marketing products. Think of how you can market your own products. Think of the Facebook, the Instagram pages, or even a company website. Especially the Facebook pages and the social media. Those mm. have a very big impact because what we post is what we produce and it's got a very, very good or bad impact on our company. So we need to be careful of the social media um, advertising. It can spread really quickly. It's a very good aspect that you can use in order to spread the word about our products. Now, as we market our products online, we need to monitor what's happening online. We need to understand what people are saying about our brand because that's, that has a significant impact on the service delivery to allow you to meet our stakeholders' needs. And we also, uh, as, as, as well as you have listened to what mm -hmm. they will say about our products, and we see if there's any improvement that's required on our side. Now, let us look into the e-commerce. On this uh, section, we want to discuss uh, the importance of uh, enhanced customer experience and how this links with increased e-sales. Once again, uh, please uh, take this opportunity to test your knowledge regarding um, e-commerce. There's a level of understanding with regards to the importance of e-commerce, how to build an online presence, how to market your online presence, as well as the, the usage of e-commerce to sell our products. The online presence and doing business online brings lots of fantastic opportunities. It can help us or help your business in new and exciting ways. Once your business is online, there are many new opportunities you can take advantage of, from selling your products from your website or application. Even our vegetables, even our other uh, agricultural services that we offer, we can offer this online. The digital presence. This means that we are visible when people are online or searching for a business that offers our products and services. Think of people need to be supplied whatever we produce. A digital presence only can allow us to be visible to such people. They might watch a video that you have posted online, testimonials from happy customers. That is why our online presence has to be very, uh, very effective at all times so that anyone who's looking for our services can quickly look, um, have an idea of who we are and what we sell. Now, how can we build your online presence? There are a lot of options. We can, uh, the most easy one is the use of the website and Facebook pages. These are some of the easiest uh, social media online presence um, uh, websites that you can use to, in order to market our, our products, especially in agriculture. A website is important, a Facebook page is important, so that we post everything about our services and our products. This will give us a good visibility digitally. We can also use e-commerce to sell. People have been making online purchases on websites and mobile applications for a while now. People are used to, to, to the change that's happening around. We need to adapt to such, if possible, in our operations. Can we use online platforms to sell our products? Think about it and see how you can implement that in your own operations. Now, remember, we are going to post an exam regarding um, sales, marketing, and e-commerce and how we can utilize these platforms and the importance of this in, um, in marketing. I hope you enjoyed and have an overview and a broader understanding on the importance of marketing, especially segmenting ourselves in a way that we can reach our customers. An example will be posted. Please prepare fully.
go through the training manual, go through the features that we've had, um, complete the exam as it is part of the assessment. This is the time when we're going to have our question and answer section open to everyone. Let us uh, orderly um, post our uh, questions and any discussions that we might have. Until next time, thank you so much.